Okay, everybody. Welcome to the Gig Money Podcast. My name is Cody, and I am joined by my co-host, Drew. And we talk to musicians about the uh, various different jobs that they take in order to finance their musical dreams. So, with that being said, today our guest is Grant Evans. He has a very wide background of musical projects and a very wide background of side gigs that he has used. So, we're going to start this off. Grant, yes. How's it going, Grant? It's going pretty good, man. Super stoked to be here with you guys. Thank you for having me. Absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about what you're doing currently, the uh, project you're working on, and uh, a little bit of your background. So, I play guitar and uh, uh, sing backing vocals in a rock band called Sleep Signals. Uh, that's my current project, and I've uh, been in that band for about three years and done a lot of touring with that band. Um, I also got my own solo project that I started releasing music um, about a year ago. I only got three songs out, but uh, that's just kind of like my side passion. It's a little bit more, you know, screamy metalcore stuff. And, um, yeah, I've I've had uh, lo- a lot of projects over the years, so... Uh, I, I got to kind of pipe in here and say that I've listened to your uh, side project, your Grant Evans stuff that you've released solo. And it's like every single song yeah. and they've all, they've all been like awesome. So definitely check that out. Uh, it's available on Spotify, uh, Apple music, you. anywhere you uh, listen to music and definitely go check that out. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, a lot of heart and soul went into those songs. Um, that those songs are just like like me at the core uh a- after i left my last project i really just wanted to write music that wasn't influenced by anyone else i just wanted to i wanted to play all the instruments write all the lyrics i didn't want to have anyone suppress any of my lyrics uh so it's been super fun to just write whatever i want when I want, it's been like a, a therapy session, kind of. That's the great thing about music. It's just, it's a therapy session. Like you said, it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's very like cathartic at a point when you put so much effort into something and you're tired and it comes out and there's, there a good response to it. And, um, you know, you put, you, when you put everything into it, you don't really know what to expect when, what you're getting back. But if you release music that really connects with people, it's there's nothing like it. That is why we do what we do. It's exactly you, you know that connection that we have with people, that emotional connection. We're trying to say something, and you know somebody listens to it and they really vibe with what's going on in the song with the lyrics. That's nothing like it. Incredible. And you know, there's the there's a certain bit of like freeing yourself and being able to to you know really put things out there that really mean a lot to you based on what you yourself are writing so definitely understand how that can be a very good thing Um, i've always been in bands where it's been like a a a mixture like a soup of all these different types of peoples and different uh influences in that um and those can be great as well but i mean there's nothing better than having your own project as well. I think that that's a, a really cool deal. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what, that's what you're doing. Um, uh, and that's what great, uh, about what you said that you were uninhibited with what you were saying and the lyrics that you were writing, nobody was holding you back from saying what you really felt. And, you know, at the core of really great music, that's what it is. So I, yeah. I, I feel like that's why I really, kind of connect with the music that you've put out because it's just raw and it's you and it's not trying to placate anybody or pander to any specific group. You're just expressing yourself. No compromises. It's just all you. No compromise. Yeah. It's never surrender. Trying to write radio hits, you know, but uh, it's, uh, it's really fun to just when you sit down in front of your laptop and you're like, I'm going to write a song and I don't care if it sucks. 
um, I'm just going to try and write what whatever comes out. And, um, yeah, I, I basically just tried to, like, test myself. Uh, like, how fast can I write songs on my own and still put out a quality product? And there was a pretty big learning curve, and I... Um, I had only got my laptop and learned how to use Reaper uh, within a year of that. So there was definitely a big learning curve there, but I demoed out all the songs individually, got them to exactly how I wanted them. And then I went to uh, a studio and recorded everything. So it was a, it was a long process and it, it, it did cost quite a bit, but um, I am shifting into a new, a new direction where I'm actually... I'm going to be releasing my first song uh, pretty soon where I re I recorded, engineered, produced, and mixed all myself. I'm going to send it to someone else for mastering, but um, I've been working with some friends on really sharpening my skills, and that's going to be super exciting because I'm going to be cutting down on so many costs to where I can pump out songs on my own from my house, and they're really good studio quality stuff yeah yeah definitely i mean in this day and age you kind of have to be a uh, jack of all trades in in that way and you know just really push yourself promote what you're doing and the emotional connection that you have with the songs like you really need to do it on your own because there's nothing more pure than just your thoughts and feelings and you know that's uh that's definitely something that we like to talk about because like you said, the studio costs were just a lot, you know, definitely worth it to get your ideas, your thoughts out there. And that money has to come from somewhere, but it's definitely not sustainable at that level when, uh, especially for my solo stuff, because I'm not touring. Um, I just started releasing music on my own. So it's, it's not like I, have a merch line or anything where I can push it to people who are listening to my music so I can recoup some of that money. That eventually is the goal. Uh, you know, I don't know if playing live with my, my solo stuff is going to be a, ever a thing, maybe. Um, but definitely having maybe uh, a merch line. I do have a logo. Um, I just, I went on Fiverr. I, I paid a guy to create a logo. I think it, it looks great. So eventually it'd be really cool to have my own merch that I can push. And, uh, you know, that could also segue into so many other things like, you know, doing podcasts like you guys are just, cre just creating content all around my overall, uh, brand, you know? And some of us have been doing it on our own for a while. Yeah, definitely. And the, I don't know specifically, but uh, the person you probably contacted on Fiverr, I mean, Fiverr is great for like freelance uh, kind of jobs and stuff like that. And so any musicians that need some side hustle money, if they're really good at a particular thing that doesn't really pertain to the music, if you're good at graphic design and you go on Fiverr and promote yourself and you do a logo for Mr. Grant Evans and, and, and use that to promote your own musical ambitions. I mean, that's, it, yeah, it's, uh, there's all sort of uh, different side hustles you can get into and yeah, kind of promote what you're doing. So I want to talk about um, your background in like your career history, sure. just the, the various different jobs that you have uh, worked in order to fund your musical dreams. So what was, what was the, sure. the, the first job that you, that you had specifically so that you can continue playing music? What was that first one? Oh man. Uh, um, let's see here. So I got to take it all the way back to, uh, I started working at, I started working at this stone company, uh, they it was a manufacturing shop for like granite uh, and quartz countertops and that's when i had started my band with insight uh back in like 2012 and well that's when i started really uh, uh writing music for the project we didn't play our first show until 2014 but it uh it grew into something pretty quickly to where i was having to 
use all my vacation time to go on the road and tour. And then my bosses were super cool about, about the, the band. And after I used my, all my PTO, they would approve, uh, you know, time off without pay so that I could go on the road. It was, it wasn't like a super high corporate, uh, job. It was kind of more of a, you know, like mom and pop shop, you know? And, uh, as the company was growing, I actually, there was a lot of parallels that I could see with the company growing as my band was growing. And I had a lot of really nice conversations with the owner of the company about my band and his business. And he, uh, he had a family member that was a, uh, a touring piano player that had one hand and he had a picture of this family member in his office and whenever we talked uh, in his office, we would always talk about his family member and, and how he um, enjoyed uh, watching his family member uh, grow in his, uh, you know, his songwriting and, and, and touring and musicianship. So he really believed in me and he wanted me to really explore, you know, taking the, the band as far as I could. So I I felt very fortunate to have that person in my life that was able to supply me with a job that could pay my bills and give me the time off to tour. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of a a rare situation, but I do have a question. Um, Was the pianist also a drummer? No. So he wasn't (laughs) the drummer for Drift Leopard. (laughs) No. Okay. So in, in, in this rock business, so, so um, you were doing granite, right? And your band, was it hard rock? Yeah. So you're rocking during the day and rocking during the night, right? Rocking during the night. Yeah. Yes. Rocking 24 yes. hours a day. Rocking all the time. <laughs> all day. Yeah. Well, that definitely okay. helps. So to to answer your question, uh, I actually that that business closed down during COVID. Uh, April first, I I think was the last day I worked there of 2020, and. Uh, I was on unemployment for a couple months and obviously we, um, we weren't touring and stuff and I had, uh, I'd left, left the band. Uh, I'd left that band right before, uh, COVID in late 2019. There was just, uh, some differences within the band and I just decided I needed to move forward. So, uh, I got another, job working for a stone company and i'm still at that job i've been there three years three plus years and yes. uh so at, at this point now i have 11 years of just being in the granite industry experience seven and, years of rock experience <laughs> <laughs> right uh and so now i'm in sales uh i'm doing estimating project management and I'm actually remote, and that is the best way to fund your music endeavors because you can work from home, you can work from tour, so that's how I do it now. And a lot of successful musicians, uh, big even big musicians that you wouldn't think had a job, they have side hustles like that to where they might be working for a corporate nine to five. You just would never know when on the when they're on the tour bus before the show starts like you know they're clocking off at three in the afternoon shutting the laptop and then loading into the venue so that's how i do it yeah that's definitely uh i i know several different uh higher end kind of musicians who have very similar side hustles i I think about it because I just uh, saw a advertisement pop up the other day for uh, Maddie Mullins from Memphis Mayfire, and he's talking about how it's d- very difficult to eat on tour, eat good on tour, and that's definitely true. And he's promoting this frozen meal service that uh, provides him with the different meals that he needs, and they just yeah. pop it in the freezer of the bus and. And and him promoting that definitely is a side hustle for him. And I know he's got tons. Like he he is yeah. an entrepreneur to the core. He's got all different side hustles. 
And it's just very inspiring to see somebody of that level just working, just pushing and pushing and grinding and grinding and doing the work that they need to do to continue being part of the music industry. So, yeah, yeah like, I've actually seen that ad. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yes. So they, they do frozen food and then they have to fire it. So Memphis may fire the frozen food. Yeah. You're you might full fire it in of the microwave. You're full of these dad jokes, aren't you, Andrew? <laughs> it's what I do, man. It's what I do. Andrew is the dad joke extraordinaire. That's just a, that's True. just what he does, like and it. that's that's why we love him. Yep, that's, I like that's it. what I'm here for. Yeah, absolutely. So I am curious because you've been in the rock industry and the music industry in tandem for quite a while. Did did you need any like schooling or certifications? Or, um, you know, you, you said you're in sales and you said you're doing project management. Was there anything above and beyond the normal thing that you needed to accomplish some schooling in order to get to that point? Uh, I, I should have an engineering degree, but I don't. I am actually a college dropout. I was putting myself through college and working and starting a band all at the same time. and it kind of got to a point where I was like, you know, the band doing the band stuff is way cooler than going to school. So I, uh, I dropped out, but I, I was going for an engineering degree and I, you know, I had some experience from college that I was able to at least put on my resume. And, uh, that's what got me the job working at the granite shop. I started out as a, CNC operator because I had worked with uh, small CNC machines in college. So I started out as an operator and then moved into the office as a programmer. And as I progressed in my career at the granite shop, I progressively just moved into more administrative roles, which eventually got me into the, uh, uh, the estimating side of things where I could be, remote. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, even the, you, you said you're a college dropout. I am also a college dropout. So, you know, the information and kind of education you received there supported a job that you could use to yeah finance your, your musical ambitions. So that's, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. I, I, uh, you know, I don't know if if you still have uh, college debt or not, but I remember w when I made my last payment, and that was like the greatest feeling of my life, right there. Yeah. <laughs> I graduated so in two thousand seven with from college, and I just paid it off two years ago. So I mean, it was forever. It took for freaking ever, and yeah, you know, and the college it's debt such a, was just so it's much. Su such a low interest rate you uh it's it's honestly not smart to you know if you should pay off other debt first right because right. you should pay off your high interest debt first so i just you know made the minimum payments and uh uh if i could if i could afford a, to pay a little bit more i would but uh it just took forever and the fact that i was paying for something that i i never got a degree from it kind of sucked right. but yeah, it was very, very nice uh, to pay that off. Now, talking about uh, monthly payments and interest and everything on loans, I want to know how much debt did you rack up with your peanut butter problem? Um, yeah, I mean, I had a pretty <laughs> crippling uh, peanut butter addiction for a couple years. Uh, back in 2017, I believe it was, uh, I was promoting the single hopeless from my band with insight. And we, uh, we did a music video for that song and it was like a parody to where like there was a bunch of drug references, but we used like peanuts and peanut butter and, uh, yeah, we used a lot of peanut butter in that video. And, uh, I did a bunch of promo for that where I was like, I smeared peanut butter all in my beard. <laughs> and I mean, it, uh, we took some pretty high quality photos. I mean, it looked like legit, like, like it should be like on like a magazine, you know? 
Mm-hmm. Um, somehow it looked cool, but also like really raunchy at the same time. Um, yeah, that's just nuts. Yeah. It's, I mean, <laughs> it, you weren't wearing anything but peanut butter, and there, were, there was probably some underwear there, but mostly peanut butter, right? Oh, yeah. The Christmas <laughs> photo. Are you talking about that? Oh, yeah. That's like I, I had that as my screensaver for a long time. Yeah. So yeah. Raunchy. A lot of people did. Yeah, there's a photo floating around <laughs> on the internet of me in in candy cane boxers laying on my bed, enjoying uh, a big jar of of with in sight peanut butter. We had our own labels, by the way. Oh, nice. See, I was going to ask, you know, what what the favorite peanut butter was. Some nice presents scattered all around the bed while I'm eating this peanut butter. That was a good promo. Yeah, absolutely. How much? debt did you rack up with all of that peanut butter like seriously that's that's a lot of credit card payments for all yeah. that gif yeah it was it was a lot yeah i'm still paying on it i i remember the one cool thing that i uh noticed about this video was that it was pretty much done all in one shot right and i thought it's that a was one just take, yes yes and like it, the cinematography that was done there the planning that was put behind it in addition to that uh, idea of using like a substance as non-threatening as peanut butter, you know, to illustrate yeah. like drug issues and stuff like that. Like it, there were so many layers to it that it really just kind of drew me in. And, you know, I found it very, very interesting. So it's pretty funny. I look back on that video now and <laughs> I, I, gosh, it feels like it was so long ago. I basically, Whenever I see myself when I don't have the tattoos that I have now, I, I, I'm like, holy crap, I was a baby. I was so small. I was in my early 20s, you know, and I just I had no idea about life. I was just a dude in a in a metal band just trying to do stuff, you know. Yeah. But we always feel like we know, you know, back then we're like, oh, I know everything kind of a, a thing, you know. And, and then you look right. back and you just kind of go, yeah, I was a baby. Maybe I was just a little you know, sure of myself. I I, yeah. I have a lot of those times where you look back and you're just like, man, I really knew nothing. And I thought I knew a lot and knowing is half the battle. <laughs> it is the more, you know, all right. So, uh, Grant, I am interested in some of the interesting past side hustles that you've had. Um, you know, just stuff that you've done part time to, you know, keep, paying the bills so that you can yeah. keep doing what you want to do. Yeah, that's that's a good question. Um I've tried quite a few different things. Um you know, I we start we talked about the stone industry. I'm still doing that, but um I have acquired uh a pressure washer and and like lawn care tools recently because I bought a house, right? And I was like, man, these tools are expensive. How can I, how, like, how can I pay myself back from buying this like six hundred dollar pressure washer? And uh, you know, so I actually created an, an ad uh, to start promoting a uh, like a pressure washing lawn care service, and I haven't posted it yet. I did make a uh, I did make a post in my local like neighborhood group on Facebook just to try to, you know, put feelers out there for, um, you like mowing lawns and stuff like that. And, um, you know, I've, I've put out a couple quotes. I don't have any, uh, actual jobs yet, but that's something that I'm like currently seeking. And that's going to be like something that's going to be like, I'm going to be refining that all the time. Right. Yeah. And that's Um, something that you can always do. People, always need some sort of lawn care and you know pressure washing is never a bad idea because weather happens and and it's yeah it's definitely a field that you could get into and um you know have a steady flow of work if you really yeah. put yourself into it yeah and and the idea for that is definitely to to keep my overhead super low and um like i i'm literally going to start off by just flyering my my own neighborhood and just giving giving discounts for being close and just starting there to see kind of what happens and who knows if it kind of takes off and i like doing it then maybe i'll i'll do more of it right 
but at least for now, I have my uh, I have my nine to five that I you know I get to work from home, so that's paying the bills, and I get to try these other things, uh, you know, on the side. Um, another thing I've actually got into quite recently was Pokemon cards. Man, I I've actually been holding on to my collection for so long. And then I sold some of my cards recently, and I was like, "Holy crap!" There's yeah, they're vintage a, now, aren't they? Yes, there's. And it's crazy market. because I don't feel that old. I I just feel like Pokemon cards are like something that came out uh, two years ago, but uh, they're they're vintage now, and they have yeah. quite a price tag, right? Yeah. So uh, I actually uh, I've been looking online for you know buying cards and stuff. I actually bought. Uh, I bought eighty dollars worth of of uh, Pokemon cards at a garage sale just two weeks ago, and uh, I look I looked up all their value on a TCG player, and they're worth over thirteen hundred dollars. So it's a pretty good profit margin. And that's just what TCG player says they're worth. You know, uh, I I have to sell each card individually, but and and I only bought thirty four cards. So if you do the math, like that's still a, that's still pretty good, right? Um, so that that's something else that I've been kind of diving into because I think it's I think it's cool. It's part of my history. It's part of my past. I I like I like Pokemon, and I was like, man, I can I can just go to some garage sales and find some Pokemon cards, make a couple bucks. That's cool. Uh, I uh, I sent in like 10 of my cards to be graded and I'm about to get them back. And from the research that I've done is it, it helps vet the value of those cards so you can sell them for more. So I'm going to be testing the waters and, and see if it's worth it to get these cards graded and flip them. Or if I should just flip them as soon as I buy them, because it does cost, quite a bit to get them graded. I think I paid a, like I paid my $25 membership fee for a CDC card player and it was like 25 bucks. And then after I shipped 10 cards, I paid like $170. So, uh, but one of the cards specifically might be worth like $6,000. So, you know, I'm going to put it on eBay and, and see if I get any bites. So, yeah. Well, you heard it first here, kids. Flip your Pokemon right. cards, and you can you can uh, make enough money to sustain yourself on tour. But you no, know, that's really cool because I was really into the Pokemon card thing too, and um, you know because of various different things, I didn't hold on to my collection. I should have because they hold yeah. a lot of worth. Right. Uh, yeah. There's a there's a, there's actually a couple other things on my list. Uh, for side hustle stuff i i i I don't do it anymore but um i started a youtube channel a while back and i was posting rain videos like 10 hour long rain videos because i i found a bunch of channels where they're just like posting like white noise sounds and the videos are super long and i like to sleep with the fan on and I was like, man, I bet I bet all of these channels are getting millions of views because people are just listening to these rain sounds for 10 hours. And YouTube likes it when you are on their platform for 10 hours. So they're going to reward those creators, right? So I started yeah, I do it. I, I listen to it. <laughs> that's awesome. I Yeah. I started f- like filming rain videos and uploading them to YouTube and uh, it wasn't really getting any traction, and I uh, I stopped doing it just because I wasn't really passionate about it. I, you know, it it's definitely something that could take off if you do it consistently for six months or a year or something. But uh, I just found myself, you know, wanting to do other things with my time that I uh, was either seeing an immediate return from or just other stuff that I was more passionate about. 
yeah, there has to be some level of fulfillment there. And whether it's some immediate fulfillment or something that's a little bit deeper that might take a little bit more time, I think that's really what's important. That's what you need to get down to your core to really figure out. And yeah, doing rain sounds. I mean, yeah, absolutely. There's like, like you said, there's channels out there that post nothing but rain sounds and have millions and millions of views. And so like the, the one that I listened to. something that didn't happen overnight. Yeah, yeah they I didn't just post one, one rain video and it became like this huge sensation. <laughs> and that <laughs> happens with a lot of things. You have to, you know, it might seem like an overnight success, but really when you peel back the layers, you see that there is a lot more work that has gone into anything really that is actually successful. And I think that's a little bit of the problem that a lot of people these days see because you know everything is kind of keyed into seven second videos and that's all you really get of somebody's life and you think that's what it is and these people are wildly successful sharing videos of their life and you don't really understand it because it's not like super different from what you're used to it's very relatable and that's why you watch it like oh i feel exactly the way this person does but you don't see behind the scenes, there's like 10 hours of that person trying to record the perfect take or having different ideas and just putting all of that time into it. And the, the music industry is definitely the same. Like you hear a mixed and mastered version of a song and you think it's great. You don't hear the hundreds and hundreds of hours of work by various different people that have been put into it that really made it what it was. So, you know, you kind of have to pull back the curtain a little bit there. And, you know, that's that's a little bit of what we're trying to do here is show people a little bit of the uh, behind the scenes of, you know, all sorts of different successful musicians, yeah. what they do to keep it going. I, I think that's, you know, you had uh, the idea, you saw the need for something and you tried it and realized you weren't passionate about it. Yeah. So you moved on to the next thing and failure is something that you have to expect yeah. if you want to move forward. And just, so just yeah, the fact that I tried it, you know, I was like, man, I'm just going to, I'm just going to like, you know, I'm going to try it. I think I did it for like two months and I was trying to post, uh, it was like one video every day or every other day. Uh, and it, I was, the biggest thing is just being consistent. If you're really going to try something, you know, definitely put 110% into it. Um, but if you, it's okay to stop. It's okay to, to fail. You know, put your time and effort into something that you really love. Yeah. It must rain a lot where you're at. <laughs> it does. Oh, yeah. It does. I can uh, every, every single definitely... day you post a new rain video. <laughs> it rains every day. Yeah. It can't rain every day. It rains every day. No. <laughs> Pretty, it almost does, yes. <laughs> but uh going on that note what would you be doing if you didn't have to uh work these side hustles every single day and music wasn't your main passion like what would you what what is your secondary main passion that you could see yourself doing if music wasn't it for sure uh i battle with this one all the time and that is racing motorcycles and I, I you could almost throw that into the same category as a side hustle because you know I am definitely aspiring to be really good at racing but I'm also aspiring to be a really good musician and both of those things take so much time and, money. and so I'm constantly like on the weekends I'm like man should I should I go out and ride today or you know like even during the week like should I play my guitar or should I take my bike out I mean, it's also very expensive, right? But at the top, those people are also making a lot of money. And um, I've got three podiums right now uh, just in this year. And nice. I have, I think there's like seven or eight more races this year that I've, uh, that I've signed up for. And they're just, they're just local races. But uh, at the top of your class, I mean, you can easily make a couple hundred bucks to a couple thousand bucks. So nice. um, it's a huge passion of mine. I've been riding dirt bikes uh, since I was like six years old. Um, 
in you know it might not necessarily pay my house payment uh if i get to that level but if i could at least start to cover some of my costs for maintaining the motorcycle and traveling to these places to go race see now that's sick because you're doing something that you're you love to do and you're being compensated to do it you know yeah and you actually have a uh you're you're start you've started a youtube channel with uh different reviews of these tracks that you've been racing on right and yeah um yeah why don't you tell us a little bit more about that yeah so just kind of i i decided to to start that youtube channel because i'm like all right i have this studio in my house and i have the equipment and the knowledge to you know put together videos and i'm going to these places all the time i mean sometimes two or three times a week i'm going to different places and like doing trail riding and doing track riding and i'm doing several different styles of racing there's mx racing there's off-road racing there's long course there's short course and I was like, man, it would be really cool if I could kind of make that into a side hustle to where that's subsidizing my cost for for writing. And at the same time, you can also get sponsorships because, you know, you go through tires, you go through brakes, you go through hand grips, you got to change your oil every 10 hours. Uh, It's expensive. Um, But if if i could turn this youtube channel into you know something uh that's at least paying me a little bit for doing something that i love that would be super cool uh it's called ride ride 360 motorsport and i only have a couple videos up there right now but it's definitely something that i'm i'm looking to do more of so whenever i'm not doing music stuff that's kind of what i've been doing cool yeah and i've seen a few of the videos and you you can definitely tell that it's something that you care about you're passionate about and i think that's what really you know sets us apart you yeah it's something that really resonates to your core so yeah definitely yeah keep doing that i noticed that there is a like specifically in my area there's like seven or eight different racetracks all within a like a two-hour range and I noticed when I was trying to find information about them on YouTube, there wasn't a whole lot about these tracks. And so I was like, there's kind of a need here. I'm just going to create these videos and see if other people enjoy them. Like if I was the consumer, what would I want to know about these tracks before I go drive two hours to go ride here? Yeah, that's what they see. See a need, fill a need. And, you know, yeah. if it's something that you're really interested in, then it really shows. And, you know, I think that's, yeah. I think that's fantastic. I think that's awesome. Um, is there perhaps anything else you want to talk about, uh, what you're doing these days that, uh, everybody should know about? Um, well, let's see here. Uh, there's actually another side hustle that has been very lucrative that I want to, I want to talk about cause, um, uh, maybe other musicians could, uh, I think other musicians need to hear this. Uh, have you guys heard of the app Turo? So yeah, you can, that's a, uh, that's car rental, uh, but it's something that you wouldn't be able to get at your local Hertz rent a car. It's a little bit more specialized, right? Yeah. Uh, you can, yeah, you can rent Tesla's on there. You can rel- rent Lamborghinis, uh, or you could rent my 2015, F-150. And my truck has, uh, you know, like my truck is expensive, right? It's, I I bought it at a dealership. You know, I take really good care of it, but, um, at the end of the day, I mean, owning a full size truck is, is not cheap. And, you know, if I go on the road and I'm touring for two months, I'm not driving it. So why not make money while your truck's just sitting there? And it's got, uh, you know, it's got keyless entry. Uh, you know, I can change the code on the door to get in and out. And, uh, you know, you, you just communicate with people through the app. I don't even have to be there. 
and people come and pick up the truck and all the insurance is done through the app. It's super clean. It's super easy. And I'm at least making my truck payment every month with the app. And nice. I'm renting the truck anywhere between like 10 and 14 days out of the month. Uh, I do have to say, it, if you have something that's more special and more unique on the app, you're going to get more, uh, more clients. Uh, my truck has a canopy on it, and it rains here a lot. So the fact that I have a full-size pickup where you can put stuff in the back, like if you're taking your family on a road trip, you can put all your bags and stuff in the back, then that actually, that's uh, that's solving a problem for someone. So there's a lot of people that rent my truck that are taking their family on a road trip to go see family, or maybe they're going snowboarding and they need a vehicle. Um, so that's been a very, a very lucrative, uh, side hustle for me. Uh, you, you might want to do some research into your area and see if, if your, if your area is good for Turo, but, um, yeah, you know, you got to meet some minimum requirements with your vehicles and stuff, but it's a pretty good, pretty good side hustle. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds really cool. Uh, essentially like a, a Verbo or an Airbnb where it doesn't have to yep. be like, a corporate entity to rent, yeah. you know, a vehicle for you to use. And I mean, I, I think that's really cool it's that Airbnb uh, while for you're your out on tour. Yeah, exactly. That's, yeah, that's awesome. So, okay. Um, one thing that I did want to touch on is, uh, you and I have discussed various different, um, things that we have done to promote the band that have not been, uh, fronting, the band in and of itself. And, you know, it comes right down to, I started uh, doing a lot of booking under the name Emissary Booking to get a little bit more credibility and le legitimacy for everything that I was doing because if it's just a band reaching out to you and saying, my band is so great, you should check them out. You know, it, it might be the same person reaching out, but it, right. it, it definitely helps to have that professional kind of stage for you to... Um, reach out to various different movers and shakers in the industry. And I know that you have done that as well. So I just wanted to hear a little bit of a backstory on yeah. all of those different things. Yeah. That, that topic definitely flows into um, just like, there's so many things that you learn from being in a, a DIY band and just trying to make it work. Right. And I found out after booking, you know, a bunch of national tours and I, I was doing all the booking, um, you know, still as a very small time band, uh, I decided to make a separate booking email and I just called it uh, Evans Entertainment Management. And I just started reaching out and uh I actually started reaching out as a different under a different alias. I was uh, my name was Wes for some reason. I just I was like I want to just be a different person and see if that makes a difference. <laughs> uh, but then that just like the conversations got kind of confusing. So uh, I advise don't doing that. But um, definitely creating a booking email and reaching out and you just like. Hey, this is so and so. I am reaching out on behalf of this band and booking a couple dates in this area. Blah blah blah. It just it it makes the band look a lot more legit when you're quote unquote working with someone to book the show, and uh, your response rate definitely goes through the roof. So I, I would like if any band is serious about doing their own booking and stuff, I would try that. Yeah, definitely. It it works because it definitely lends a different level of legitimacy to the band. Just saying that you have somebody that believes in you that is not necessarily acting as the band, but on behalf of right. the band. And, you know, until you get an actual booking agent who is not fraudulent <laughs> and it's very hard to find that in the very, very early stages of a touring yes. band. You, you do it yourself and you do it because yes. you're the person that you can trust. So 
there that that's actually the reason why uh my band with insight was diy for so long because we got burned from a booking agency on our very first tour because we had no idea what we were doing and uh we paid this person up front for the dates but like they seemed legit right and we're just a bunch of kids and how are we supposed to know what is proper in this industry right so we paid them up front for the dates and the dates did not get booked but we all had the time off of work to go do the tour and it was literally th- like three days before tour was about to start and uh it was only supposed to be like nine shows uh nine consecutive shows nine shows in nine days and i said you know what let's go do it anyways. And everyone just looked at me like we were crazy because we were crazy. We were supposed to go down through. uh, So it was like Washington, Oregon, California, Nevada, and Utah. So we were supposed to do shows in those States. And I said, you know what? Let's go. We're like, where are we going to (laughs) go? And I said, let's figure it out. Like, I, I am so sick of being pushed around by these people that just think they know everything. And they can, t- I was just pissed off because they took my money. So, and, and it was my money, okay? It wasn't the band's money. I worked really hard for that money, okay? That was, that and, was your gig money. Yeah. Plug in the and pocket. They, and they took it, okay? So, yeah. So we 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 went on the tour and uh so starting 2 days before the tour we started booking shows. We literally we we just got onto Facebook and and Instagram and we found existing shows and asked if we could hop on uh or you know we found some bar to play and we're like hey we had a date fall through can we come here and play and uh, we literally booked seven shows out of those nine dates. And, Within a handful and, of days. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. We, I mean, so, a couple of the shows we booked the day of because we just couldn't find anything, you know, two or three days ahead of Ants. And uh, it, it, it was very difficult, but we made it work. And, you know, we, we were playing shows for free. Hey, can we come to your bar? Can we play for free? Can we, collect a donation at the door just for some gas money, stuff like that. And, uh, we made relationships on that tour that were more valuable than any money could have paid us because, because we made fans on that tour and we made relationships with venues and other bands to where, uh, three or four months later, we did that same tour again and we came back and we played all of those places but this time we asked for a door deal or a small guarantee uh, because I personally, you know, shook the hand of the owner of the bar or the venue. I met these people. They liked me. And th- that's what it's all about. Just creating relationships to where you can go back to these places and and play. And if your band is good, people are going to buy your merch. Yeah, you're going to pretty much break even on gas, and that's what you want for for starting out like that. That's all you need. Just break just break even on gas, replenish your merch later. Uh But yeah, that was that was my experience with the booking agent that screwed us <laughs> over. Uh Yeah, I believe I mean, their well, name was Red Dragon out of, out of California. Ooh. I don't know if they're still a thing, but Probably not. Screw those people. <laughs> Mm. Yeah. You know, yeah, there's, there's a lot of power in networking. That's true. And yeah. I think that uh, just just hearing your story and drawing a lot of parallels to um, my own experiences, you could have easily at that point said, we gave this guy X amount of money and he didn't do anything with it. We should have shows booked. We should just give up. We should, we're not going to go on tour. We're just going to go back to work and make more money and then maybe try again whenever we recoup from, you know, the loss, because 
who knows that person might have been in, in the winds and you can't you can't get that money back so the fact that you guys just pulled up your bootstraps and went ahead and did it and made it happen on your own that's what really sets people apart in this industry and that's that's what really propels you forward because if you do that yeah. on every single tour every single thing that you do despite your setbacks you are going to keep moving forward and at a rate that you might find very very surprising so yeah, yeah absolutely kudos kudos for that kudos for putting in the time and effort to actually making it happen when somebody else failed you because you don't know who to trust in this industry and no. unless you you know have actually had a decent amount of success in the industry you're all you're going to see are scam artists <laughs> yes absolutely it's so so is disgusting. it's dangerous yes that and like they trust on no those one of us who don't know yes that is also very true like just do everything yourself if you can and if you're letting other people do stuff for you you better know who they are because they will take money from you they don't care it's it's brutal out there it really is it's rough for sure um and that like that's that's some really good advice to anybody listening to um make sure that you steer clear of any of those situations and always be mindful when you go into something that there is a very distinct possibility that somebody is going to take advantage of you because you have such a strong attachment to your music and your passion and they will they will nickel and dime you because of that. Yeah. They know you will pay to make it happen. So I'm curious though, that that's very good advice. I'm curious if you have any other advice to aspiring or starting out musicians that kind of want to make a living doing music. Yes. Uh, I, I have, I, I have a lot. I have a lot to say around <laughs> this topic. <laughs> just be a good person. Let's just start there because there's so many, there's so many crappy people in this industry uh, that, as long as you you keep putting the right foot in front of the other and and you're just a genuine person, then other genuine people are going to be attracted to you, and you're going to easily weed out all of the negative people that are against you. And that's a fact. Yeah. If you that's, just that's why if, I think that uh, this this person, this booking agent, that. Red Dragon booking in California or wherever is not still doing it because you get found out pretty quick and people Reputation. will. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, you have to build a reputation and if you're not like doing it for the right reasons, then people will find out if you are not a genuine person who has an interest in music and wants to promote it to the world. If you're just out there to make a buck, it won't last forever. Right. And and that and that'll shine through your music, that'll shine through your personality, that'll shine through how you hold yourself when you walk into a room. Uh, there's so much, there's so many parallels with that. Uh, just being a, a good person and being a good, likable person, uh, making relationships on the road, making relationships in your hometown, uh, like for for a small time band that's just getting started. Um, you know, word word travels fast, right? So, if 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 you're if you put together this badass band and you're just crushing it in the local scene, people are going to be talking about you. They will. If other other businesses are going to be talking about you, uh, other other bars and venues are going to be contacting you because you're crushing it in your in your hometown, and they they want a piece of the pie too, and but be careful, right? Because you, if you don't know these people, you know, definitely have your guard up a little bit and, and know your worth. But, um, you know, like as soon as you start really crushing it in your hometown, just start to branch out a little bit and you're going to, and you're going to meet more 
more good people and you're going to meet more bad people, but you're going to weed out those bad people as you, as you move forward with your, your, um, you know, as you start to expand your circle of how far you're playing from home. And I, I would definitely suggest, uh, you really shouldn't be playing outside your hometown unless you're selling out your local bar. And I know that sounds really harsh, but like, how do you expect to progress financially if you if if you can't even bring like 10 people out to come see you right like it because if let's say you go play uh like you know portland oregon that's where all the local bands started out where i'm from and everyone would always want to go up to seattle and play okay but that's a three-hour drive and there's gas and you got to eat and blah blah well what what do you actually gain from going up there if if you're going in the hole just to go go play a show in, in front of no one? Like, but if you're crushing in your hometown, you have good music, you're good, uh, you're a good, likable person, and you know people in Seattle are going to hear about you. Social media is huge, obviously, and uh, you know you're going to go play, play some shows up there and, and you might play in front of much less people, but again, you're, you're going to build relationships and because you're a likable person, you'll start to build that market too. And that's how my old band, uh, built up a market of about 15 States. And we, we toured those 15 States relentlessly for five years and it was fun. And we made, we made money, but it was, it wasn't a lot of money. It was, a very little amount of money, but we had fun. I had fun. Like I, I, I look back on those times and it was just so bootstrapped, like in your face metal, like we're coming to your town to have a good time. Like it was, it was incredible. I don't know. I just, I just put a bunch of stuff out there for for some new musicians, but yeah, but absolutely uh, the the core of that being just be a genuine person, be yourself, and put yourself out there because that is what music is about is um, expressing yourself, your thoughts, your emotions, yes. and you can't connect with people if your thoughts and emotions that you're putting out into the world are fake. So if you can't sell out a show in your hometown then why would anybody in any other town want to see you? Why would you want to spend hundreds of dollars of gas to get to some other place where nobody wants to see you either? You have yes. to build that up. And I think that was definitely great advice. And, you know, you have to you have to make a foundation for it. And you have to cut your teeth. You have to figure out what it takes to be in a band and to really put on a show that people can come out and connect with and It'll be something that is yeah. entertaining in a way that they can just forget about everything else that they have going on in their life and just really tune yes. in to what you're trying to say. Because that's why people go to concerts, right? There's there's music yeah. there that moves them. There's artists there that they relate to. And I yeah. think, you know, your your points are definitely solid in that. You have to build that up. You um, know, I wanted to touch on something else as well. And that's with uh, the rapport that you build up with other musicians and, uh, you know, you're networking in that because that'll tell you who the really bad people are when it comes to yes. booking agencies and stuff like that. I mean, we're a very small group of people. I mean, musicians, we all talk, we all know each other, you know, especially in a small area. So um, if somebody has a bad experience with a red dragon, you know, you're going to tell everybody that, you know, man, stay away from these people because, you know, yeah. we had this experience with them. And just like with the networking aspect, it's going to save you money as well. So so many, um, so much of the rapport that you have with the other bands. So like you say, just be a good, genuine person, but also know your industry and, and the people that you are peers with. Yeah. And, and uh, no one else smells bullshit better than other bands. So, uh, you know, you can't if, bullshit if a bullshitter. Not, That's how it works. It, yeah. If you're, if you're not, if you're not a good person and you're just, if you, if you just think that 
your shit don't stink and your your riffs are the just the coolest and uh you know you're not watching the other bands you're not respecting the other bands and giving them uh your time to at least check them out and talk to them before and after they play and and just just hanging around you know just being a part of the community if you're not doing those things then every single band is going to talk shit about you because they think that you think that you're better than everyone else. So, you know, that's some other good advice for some up and coming bands. Just, just be a, just be a part of the community, like actually genuinely hang out with these people before and after they play and, and just get to know people, you know, just talk to them. Don't even stop doing that when you're like starting to tour and being a touring band and everything like that. Don't have an ego going into it. We were talking about this recently and, you know, just treating the other musicians as colleagues rather than subordinates and just going into a show, being excited to share this experience with other musicians. You know, they might not be the greatest. They might not be as experienced as you, but that doesn't mean that you need to treat them any less because they could come back and be the band that kicks you off the bill because they're better and they're more genuine and they have less ego at at the same time. And, and also those local bands that are opening up for you, if you're playing out of town or whatever, uh, they, you know, they are aspiring to be you. They want to be you. They, it doesn't matter if you're a small artist or a big artist. Like if you're touring and stuff, I mean, everyone wants to tour and maybe the, maybe those bands have never toured before and maybe they're, they're looking up to you. And that's why it's also super important to, to pay attention to those bands and talk to them. And, and, uh, you know, it's, it's always been my mission as a musician and just as a person to inspire other people to do cool shit you know i used to say i i want to inspire music or people to play music and i've kind of shifted that to just i want to inspire people to just do stuff if you're not just if you're not trying if you're not applying yourself and trying you're never gonna you're never gonna succeed you're never gonna go anywhere so for your you know if you're starting a band just try super hard because if you fail you know what? At least you tried. You know, if you if yeah. you're gonna start a, a small business to to try and subsidize your uh, your peanut butter addiction, <laughs> just try, just do it. You know. Yeah, absolutely. I every everybody is not great at everything, but everybody is good at something. You every single person has something that they are really good at and that's something that they need to pursue, especially if you enjoy it. Uh, if you don't enjoy it, then I, I, it's kind of hard to believe that you would be great at it. But if, if you are great at something and you enjoy it and you pursue it and you give it everything, it doesn't matter if it's music or if you're a great accountant, you know, it, do it and be great at it. Yeah. And yeah, that's that's a that's a really great takeaway from from this. It's just, you know, follow your dreams and do what you got to do. If you have to, you know, work in the rock industry so that you can work in the rock industry, you got to do it. <laughs> that's exactly what I'm doing, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. All right. You know, so, we, like got one final question for you before we wrap this up. Do sure. you prefer waffles or pancakes and why? Waffles, hundred percent. Waff. I mean, pancakes are cool. Don't get me wrong, dude. I will always smash some pancakes at Denny's after a show. Don't get me wrong. But okay, uh, Waffle House or uh, there's there's been a couple small diners that I've I've been to where uh, they'll actually uh, they'll sprinkle some some almonds or something in the batter. And, and dude, that is the, by far the best waffle I've ever had. You put, sprinkle some nuts in there and it's so (laughs) crunchy and delicious and nutty. I don't know. 
I just it's a texture thing. I like Every, nuts. everything's better with nuts. But yeah, the, Andrew nuts. and I agree on the waffle aspect of this because they are geometrically shaped so that every surface is crispy and there is a lot more surface area because of the way they're set up than pancakes for that crispy. That is a good so, texture. That is a good point. I, you know, I bet there's a crazy subreddit about <laughs> waffles. You know, there is, but it's. <laughs> I'm sure a, there is a different color of a waffle. <laughs> <Blue waffles. laughs> Don't Google it. Um, Don't Google it. Uh, yeah, but you, you were talking about uh, after show Denny's, and I was just thinking about this something I saw today because every time I would go to Denny's, I would have the same order, and it just popped into my brain today because I read something that said that biscuits and gravy is essentially wet flour poured over dried flour. I mean, technically, so, yeah. Yeah, technically. Of. But yeah, that was my Denny's order. Biscuits and gravy breakfast, eggs over easy, hash browns extra crispy, and maybe two out of ten times the chef would know what was going on and made those hash browns extra crispy to nice. perfection. And you just I'm all can't about top the it. I'm all about the all American slam. You just can't go <laughs> wrong with the with the slam, you know? <laughs> you just get a get a little bit of everything. Yeah. And, I mean, uh, how can you slam if you don't want to jam? You gotta get the yeah. slam. Exactly. I love getting slammed. <laughs> <laughs> But that's another story for another day, isn't it? <laughs> that's the name of your podcast, right? Getting slammed or getting, getting jammed? Slammed? <laughs> getting slammed. <laughs> the Slammed Podcast. <laughs> Speaking of getting jammed, I was watching. Uh, uh, I was watching Spaceballs at a venue the other day while I was nice. uh, catching a band on tour. And, you know, that pivotal moment came up with, oh, the radars are jammed. Nobody would <laughs> jam our radars with Raspberry except for Lone Star. <laughs> yeah, but Spaceballs, it's where it's at. That's a good movie. <laughs> yes, absolutely. All right. Anything else you, uh, you really want to touch on? Anything else you want to talk about? Um, I was just going to plug a couple things before we go. Um, go Sleep Signals it. has a has a brand new song coming out on September 15th. It's called Patterns. I'm super excited for the song. Uh, I worked really hard on this particular song and I, I wrote most of the music for it. So uh, it's a banger. It was actually supposed to be on my solo EP and it got turned into a Sleep Signal song. So, Ooh, okay, right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a banger. I'm super stoked for it. And then the next Sleep Signals tour starts on uh, September 27th. Uh, and that's going through October 15th. And then there's also uh, the Sleep Signals Festival happening in Klamath Falls on October 22nd. Uh, cool. On top of the Sleep Signals stuff, you know, I've been working on my own music too. You can find me, uh, my name's Grant Evans on YouTube or Facebook. Uh, Instagram, um, Spotify, all those places. I got three songs up, so uh, go check it out. All right. Excellent. Yeah, definitely do. Everything that I've heard and seen has been awesome, so definitely go check it out. So anyways, um, yeah, Grant, thank you so much for talking with us and sharing your experiences about uh, your life on the road and uh, all of the gig money kind of side hustles that you have done to promote that. So until next time, I'm Cody joined by Drew. Appreciate you. Thanks guys. Thank you. Thank you. So then.